All right, ladies and gentlemen, welcome to the Wet Coast Astrophotography YouTube channel. My name is Seth. I'm an upper year student in astrophysics at UVic, and my side hobby, passion, and lifestyle is astrophotography. Today we have an unboxing video today of one of the very hard to find these days because of COVID, Celestron nine and a quarter edge telescopes. I haven't seen it yet. It's still in the box. I can't wait to open it. I've been waiting for this thing since October, and I finally finished my last set of exams for the semester, so I get to open it and hopefully use it if the weather improves a little bit. So we're going to give this a go now. It is packaged quite nicely. I can see the tube here, but there's a couple things on top of it we're going to take out first. So here, in the first box, we have our two-inch star diagonal. Now these are for visual astronomers. And I probably won't be using it too often because I do astrophotography, but every once in a while, when you have guests over, or you want to show your family, well, once COVID's over, um, then these things are nice. I do have an Explore Scientific model of these. Um, and I've got to say holding this one, they seem to be both very well built. This one's a little bit heavier, I think, um, but I'm over mounted anyways. So I think this will work just fine. I'm gonna put this one on the side. Inside here, we also have a little adapter for it, which will go into my collection of adapters that is continuously growing and will never stop. Let's open up the next box. This one's a long one. This would be the finder scope. Now, I need a knife. Ah. All right, I found my knife. I opened the box up and inside here, we have our finder scope. Now, when you're doing visual astronomy, these things are pretty handy, but again, I don't tend to do that. And so what I do is I have an ASI Air Pro, which we'll talk about in another video, and I can plate solve with that. So instead of looking through one of these to find your stars, I can just take a picture with my camera, the scope will know where it is, and I don't have to worry about finding things as much, which is gonna be really handy with a scope of this focal length when I bring it out. All right, for the next one here, we have a calendar. Now, these are cool to have, but in all honesty, if I'm waiting for events or something, I'll use Stellarium or any of those online computer sources to help me find things out. But it's always nice to get something like this to put on your wall. It looks like we've got a picture of the Eagle Nebula, which actually, seeing the original image of this by the Hubble telescope, the, if you zoom in, it's the Pillars of Creation, right in the middle of that Eagle Nebula. It's pretty much the whole reason I started this. That image inspired me to begin astrophotography and buy a small equatorial mount in the telescope, and it spiraled helplessly out of control from there. We have our instructions, which, if I'm honest, I read all of these online in entirety and tried to memorize them as the telescope was waiting in the mail because I was too excited, so I don't think I'll need to read these. All right, now, next piece in here, I'm gonna pull it out. It's in its own kind of nice little case here, and it's a luminous eyepiece. Now, at the university I go to, we have a couple of the eight inch non-edge versions of this telescope mounted on the roof, and we have one of these eyepieces in each one. It is huge. And here is our fully multi-coated 23 millimeter, 82 degrees eyepiece. Now, I'm not big into visual astronomy in the slightest, but I have to admit, I'm kind of excited to look through a lens like this. Most of my eyepieces that I currently have are the one and a quarters, and this one is gonna be nice. So I think the first time I set up the scope, I may just have to disappoint everyone I know and not actually use a camera. And back it goes. All right. And one piece left in here. I don't actually know what's in this box. 
Ah. It never actually occurred to me when I was opening up the finder scope that it would need something to attach to, but uh, this would be it. Now, I don't necessarily plan on using the top piece here, but I believe this slides right off. It should, I think. There we go. And I can just have this mounted on the scope by itself and it'll be a great spot for me to mount my other accessories that I do plan on adding since I don't really do the visual. But always good to have for the one time that uh, you do bring out things like the eyepieces to show the uh, family. Let's see if I can actually get this back together. It goes this way. Or does it? It goes this way. I do like, one thing I'm going to show you guys, it's just smart engineering. Right here you can see we've got a couple grooves on this piece. These things are really good to have because you're working in the dark, sometimes it's hard to see what you're doing, and just to have that little assurance when you're doing putting things together and there's a little bit of a slip in and it, it locks into place and you can tighten it, if things aren't perfectly 100% tight, it's not just gonna fall out completely. And so I do like the little designs that they add onto that and tells me which way to put this thing in. Which is why the first time it took so long unscrewing all these pieces. But this is very heavy, really well built, and I'm not quite sure what this is for. I think it's probably gonna sit in here. Yes, it does. Just so that the scope doesn't rub on the inside. And all these metal screws have the little plastic bits to keep it from scratching up the finder scope. Back in the box. All right. <laughs> now, the final thing to pull out here, maybe, I think there's gonna be another one thing at the bottom. Um, is the telescope itself and this thing is huge. I cannot wait. It seems to be packed quite nicely. It is nice and heavy and we have our edge telescope. Now I've been shooting so far my entire career with a 102 millimeter apochromatic refractor from Explore Scientific this is gonna be a big change for me and I can't wait. It's like starting astrophotography all over again right from the beginning. The focal length will just, the range of targets is different. Um, not saying one telescope's better than the other one. The wide field refractor I'll still use for targets, but given that it's galaxy season right now, this is the telescope I wanted to have for that and I can't wait to use it. So we're gonna cut here, I'm gonna pull this plastic off and then we're gonna have a look at it. All right, we got it out of the plastic. Everything looks pretty good. The reveal here is going to be open this. I have not seen it yet. I'm so excited. All right, now for the big reveal here. We're gonna pop this off. Beautiful. I'm gonna rotate it towards me so I can actually see it. You have no idea how happy this makes me. I am so excited. Now right here, this is a one and a quarter inch um, spot to put things, but I'll be using a two inch adapter that I have bought. This is the focuser and it feels buttery smooth. One of the upgrades I'm gonna be making to this telescope, I've already purchased it, is I'm going to be adding the ZWO electronic autofocuser onto it, just because it makes my life easier and I don't really have to touch it once it's all set up. Over here, we have our mirror clutches. And what they do, so the Schmidt Cassegrain design, if I rotate this a little bit. This is a Schmidt Cassegrain telescope. The reason it's not just a Cassegrain is because at the front here, when you saw, there's a Schmidt corrector plate. And that's what differentiates it from something like an RC that's a standard Cassegrain design. The back here, we have the mirror. Now the mirror, to focus it, will shift forward and back. As opposed to a standard telescope, a lot of the times you'll have a little piece here that will come in and out. The mirror itself moves. Now, 
to prevent it wobbling as we're slewing across the sky and taking pictures of things up there, we can lock these clutches down to stop anything from happening that way. Down the road later on, I do plan on adding a moonlight focuser to this, a Crayford style, which will make it so I can just lock these mirrors permanently and I'll attach the autofocuser onto that. But those are expensive, it's coming down the line. Got other things first. Another addition I would like to add is a top rail onto this, just so that we can add another of these orange plates that you can see on the bottom to give me a little bit more room for accessories. On top of that, we have our vents to let it cool down. The main reason I bought this telescope is, like I said, I got the wide field refractor, great for big nebulas and all that, and larger galaxies. But during galaxy season, uh, it's okay, but it's not the best thing for it. So I wanted something with higher focal length to do those images. This has exactly that. Natively, it shoots at f10, which is a little bit slow, 2,350 millimeters of focal length, which is ridiculous compared to what I'm used to at 714 with my refractor. At the back here, I can bring it down a little bit. I have a reducer, which I can show you a bit later. We can plug that into the back and it brings the entire system down to f7, which means I can get my pictures a lot faster. Being on the west side of Canada, on Vancouver Island, that's really important because the number of clear days we get isn't that high, especially during the winter. So if I can squeeze as much data out in those clear nights that we do get, perfect. The other option I do have down the road is at the front, I can take out that secondary mirror that you saw and add on a hyperstar attachment, which means instead of putting the camera back here and shooting at f10 or f7, I can put it up here. And that lets me shoot at a ridiculous f2, which is crazy, um, eventually. It's very expensive. I'd like to add it on at some point. But as of right now, being galaxy season, I'm probably going to be shooting at f10 or f7. I can't wait to try this out for that. The other reason I got this is I finally have a telescope I can do planetary images with. I have a 2 times Barlow, which brings this up to f20 but it also doubles the focal length, which is great for imaging small things like Jupiter, um, Saturn, any of those planets, but also something I usually hate, the moon. And I do plan on doing a lunar mosaic and hopefully trying to bring out a couple of the colors you can there by doing oversaturation. I'm very much looking forward to that. All right, well, thanks for watching the entire video of the unboxing process of my new child. I can't wait to finally use this thing to image some galaxies. If you have any recommendations, leave them in the comments. I'm always happy to see what people would like shot. I'm more than happy to try and imaging it myself. Could be a new challenge, always up for it. Remember, sign a petition to nuke the moon.